Good evening, my name's Lee Hills and welcome to the first edition of the Did You Know Community Talks for 2020. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we stand and pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. The Did You Know Community Talk series has been held for a few years now and the idea is for our academics and experts to share their knowledge and research with the wider community and prov provide some dinner party facts. This year, like everything else, the series will run a bit differently and all sessions will be conducted online so you can join us from wherever you are. Our first talk this series is with Senior Lecturer, Food Science Dolly, Polly, Dr Polly Bury, who will share her tips for creating less food waste and what to do with any waste you do make. Please enter any questions you have in the Q&A section of the webinar and we'll answer them when we can and there will be plenty of time for any, um, any questions at the end of the session. And if you have any comments or ideas you'd like to share with everyone, please put it in the chat section. So enough of me, please get comfortable with your warm or cold beverage and welcome Dr Polly Bury. Thanks, Lee. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this Did You Know talk. Uh, as Lee mentioned, we're focusing on food today, um, and in particular, how you can prevent food waste, which has the knock-on effect of saving money as well uh, on your grocery bill. Um, so as Lee mentioned, I'm the Senior Lecturer in Food Science here, um, but I started out my science engineering career as a chemical and materials engineer. Um, it just happened that I ended up working with the food industries quite a lot. Um, so some names I've worked with you may have heard of, uh, Cadbury chocolate, uh, dairy products, uh, and a few other things as well. Um, but what I'm here today to talk to you about is something that might affect you every day. So the facts regarding food um, and how it gets wasted here in Australia. Um, so these statistics here are from a survey that was done in Victoria not that long ago. Um, and it found that there were about, um, each year, Victorian households throw away 250,000 tonnes of waste food. That's quite a lot just in Victoria. Um, and looking at the stats, that's a waste in terms of dollars of over $2,000 per year due to that waste. Um, and then the last number that you can see there, 65% of that food that's um, based there, almost two thirds actually could have been used instead. I'll tell you some Australian-wide statistics as well. Um, so every year in Australia, we waste probably almost over 8 million tonnes of food. In terms of economic value uh, that is lost, it's $20 billion every year. Uh, because we have population growing a little bit, it grows a little bit every year. So that's quite a lot. So every person in Australia, if we average it all out, we have about 300 kilos of waste per year per person. So if you wasted 300 kilos of certain types of foods that are commonly wasted because they spoil quite easily, how much money are you losing? So I went and looked up the dollar values if you went and bought these foods in the supermarket last night um, and looked at things like strawberries. They go off fairly easily if you don't use them up in time. Um, and we can see that there's quite a lot of waste. So your baby spinach, you go buy the bagged salads. Um, if you wasted 300 kilos, yeah, that's almost $10,000. Um, that's gone in the bin. Um, and for other things, your cheaper ones, your pasta. Now, you might not think pasta is much of a waste. It's a dry product. But have you ever had the problem where you cook too much pasta? And what do you do with the rest? So you can have leftovers, obviously, for quite some time. But sometimes you might not use it. Um, and that's probably on the cheaper end of the scale, only almost about $500 worth of waste if you wasted 300 kilos there. Um, so there's quite a lot of dollar value if you just focused on one type of food. Okay. Now, um, people were asking me uh, the last week, you know, with COVID-19, people were stocking up on food so they didn't have to go to the supermarket as often. Um, and then there was the concern perhaps that was causing some waste. So sometimes we might tend to over-purchase items and then not use them in time before they actually get spoiled um, and the quality might be affected as well. So we think, oh, maybe it's not safe to eat or maybe it won't be good to eat as well. Okay. Um, so as well as the actual food being wasted, there are a lot of byproducts. So for example, if you take your orange, what do you normally do when you eat your orange? You peel it, okay? So you've paid for the whole weight of that orange, but you can take all that peel off and you're not gonna eat peel in that form anyway. Um, you're gonna eat the orange inside. So that's what we call a byproduct um, in our research, something that we might not eat. However, something like that byproduct can be used in another product. So whoever's made marmalade before, 
you'll know that you use pretty much most of the whole fruit. So you've got your peel, um, your flesh, a um, bit of your pith maybe, although it might cause a bit of bitterness. So some people aren't fond of marmalade because of that flavour, um, but that's where it's coming from, okay? So today, what I'm going to talk to you about is some of the ways that we can prevent putting more food in the bin um, and using it for other purposes, okay? So uh, until I'll dazzle you with a little bit of science, then we'll delve into the practical applications. Um, so preventing this excess food going in the bin um, and it turning into waste because of that reason, um, and, and byproducts, as we talked about with the peel, um, it, is effect, you know, it is an effect of our entire food supply chain. So from production on farm all the way to when the consumer gets it. So we have quite a lot lost along the way. Um, one way we can tackle this, because of the problem that we have in Australia, is sometimes there's a lot of distance to cover to get the food from where it's made to where it needs to end up. Okay, um, and so some things that we can do is tackle the waste where it's generated. So you might have seen a lot of news stories where there's tons of strawberries on farm that don't make it to a consumer, or tons of pineapples. Um, and one of the reasons is sometimes it costs more to send it to be processed than there will be returned. So it might not be financially viable to actually send it, and that's a bit of a problem. So some ways that we can overcome this, which our team focuses on, is taking the process to the waste rather than trying to move the waste to the process. And that way we can come overcome some of those cost hurdles because some of the things can be used on farm. So if you dry your product to extend its shelf life, the water that you dry off, you could potentially use for irrigation um, and, use some, and then only take a little bit of material off farm and drop your costs. However, and that's what happens if you don't use it up in time. So we can use this kind of approach at home. We can do what we call modular processing at home. So taking some of the technologies we use in the food industry um, and apply them to everyday processes, okay? So I won't dwell too much on this one because this is more of the science, but our research group focuses on pretty much four pillars, which is one, capture the food before it gets in the bin, uh, preserve it so that you can use it over a longer period of time before spoilage. The other area that we focus on is what's called extracting and refining. So we take any volume, uh, sorry, valuable nutrients and vitamins and high value items that you might see in you know, vitamin pills and things like that. Um, we have one other area which focuses on our, our safer process. So we've got a symbiotic process, which you'll see near the end, um, where we might produce alcohol. Um, so you might make a nice gin or a schnapps. Um, and as a, a side product, you could also use the CO2 from that process to feed some spirulina. So you end up with two products coming out of there um, that could be consumed. Uh, and then lastly, we're all about towards zero waste. So even with that sort of um, fermentation and spirulina process, there's still a little bit of organic material left at the end. And that kind of stuff can go straight to compost um, or animal feed in some instances. So everything has a purpose. Um, and that's what we're all about uh, in terms of our research. So what does it actually mean for the everyday person um, buying their groceries? Shelf life is probably one of the main reasons why food gets thrown out. And there's two dates you sometimes see on things, your use by date, and that one is the safety one, okay? So if you go beyond that, then potentially the safety of the food's compromised. Best before, it means it's probably still okay, but it's not as high quality as it was. So you need to pay attention to those. However, one of the problems is sometimes something doesn't have a best before or a use by date on it. Okay, so you buy your broccoli, there's no use by date stamped on that. So how do you figure that out? It's a little bit of an issue. So you can do a little bit of research um, on how long might, something might last and calculate, will you use it up in time? So if you bought a head of broccoli, how long is that going to last you? And will you use it up within its shelf life? Okay. Now, if you still have stuff um, and you want to prevent it becoming waste, there are things you can do. And some of you guys probably already do these things. Um, so the good old fridge um, is a really good way to extend your shelf life. Um, so if you left your, um, I guess, some of the things, broccoli out on the bench, it would not take very much time before it starts going a little bit yellow um, and a little bit nasty. If you stick it in the fridge, it lasts a bit longer. If you stick it in the freezer, um, even better. But there's something that you need to do to broccoli before you stick it in the freezer to prevent some processes which sort of create um, that characteristic broccoli aroma. Um, that some of you may be familiar with. So what you sometimes need to do is a bit of a cooking process that's called blanching. So when you blanch, it's not quite boiling. It's not all the way up to 100. It's a bit below, between 80, 90, something like that. 
So you cook it very quickly for a few minutes, chill it, and then you can freeze it, okay? And that will prevent some of the development of that odor um, that will happen. You can do that with potatoes as well, because um, if you chop potatoes and then just try and freeze them, they actually start browning because um, there's some enzymatic reactions taking place. But blanching stops that, okay? So if you're going to cook and freeze your vegetables, you probably need to blanch, chill, and then set them into the freezer, okay? Now, cook chill. So in the industry, we call it cook chill. When we cook food, then we chill it down to a safe temperature. So we do that to avoid what we call the danger zone. Um, so between five and 60 degrees, if you spend too much time in that temperature range, that's when you might get your dangerous microbes that might make you sick um, or spoil your food. Um, so if you're cooking above 60, you're pretty decent chicken, maybe a little bit higher. Um, and if you're below five degrees in your fridge or something like that, that will make your food safe. Okay. So cook chill um, is the industry word for leftovers. Um, and so a lot of us might do that or, or meal plan. You can do cook freeze as well. You can dry your stuff um, and that can make it last much longer. Um, and then there are a few other processes which I'm going to get through there so you guys can have a little bit of a read. Um, and probably I've got an arrow down the bottom, uh, sorry, pointing down the bottom, which says effort. So as you move down the list, it might take a bit more effort um, to do these processes. Okay. Whoops, sorry, I skipped there. Um, so with your fruit and veggies, I mentioned they don't have that use by date stamped on them. So you can sometimes go look up, well, how long will it actually last? So with your berries, for example, they might only last a couple of days um, at a decent sort of quality. Um, but you have your carrots, they last a little bit longer. Um, so you've got a bit more time. So if um, you know they're only going to last a few days, but you want them to last even longer, again, freeze um, or chill. There are some things you can do where you freeze and process it. Um, so with your bananas, you can actually make ice cream. Um, so if you chop up your bananas and freeze them and then blend them up, they actually have a texture that approaches ice cream. Um, and so you're avoiding, I guess, a lot of that sugar syrup and all sorts of other things that typically go into ice cream and you've got straight banana. Um, you can add other things into it as well. But there you go, your bananas, not just banana cake, um, you can make banana ice cream as well. You see a lot of products in the supermarket these days where they talk about smoothie cubes um, and things like that. That's just a way to make your fruit and veg last a bit longer as well and maybe charge you quite a bit more for the privilege. Uh, but if you have enough ice cube trays at home, you can do this yourself. So we've got our strawberry there. If we can also blend that up, but then maybe stick it in your ice cube trays, uh, then you can make that last a bit longer. So things in the freezer, they can last a few weeks to a few months, depending on what the item actually is. Okay. Now, um, that's sort of fruit and veg, but what about meat? Um, so meat has some different types of safety challenges that fruit and veg might have. Um, so why we process meat, it's to prevent microorganisms that make us sick or spoil our food, as I mentioned. And there's a nice picture of some E. coli under the microscope where if you have too much of it, it makes you feel sick. Um, so in terms of shelf life, your fresh meat can last minutes to hours if you leave it out on the bench. Um, or in my case, I have a Great Dane and it won't last very long at all. Um, your fresh meat in the fridge, though, will last probably about two to three days decently um, in terms of quality. But a lot of us might buy, you know, meat in bulk, portion it up and then freeze it um, and then pull it out to defrost in the fridge as we need it. Now, if you've got your leftovers, they're typically only a few days as well. Okay, Leftovers in the freezer, though, another story altogether. Um, and your eggs. Now, eggs are really quite interesting. You can freeze eggs, um, not in the shells so much. But if you crack them, for example, into a little muffin tray, you can freeze them that way um, and then defrost and use them uh, again as well. Okay. Now, dried meat. Um, so we talk about space food sometimes, which is often freeze dried. Um, and that's becoming a bit more of a need to design food that can last a really long time. So we've got Mars missions at the moment where probes are going and, and rovers are going. There was one that went out just recently. Um, but to, in order to get people out in a space, we need food that lasts a really long time. So we use these kinds of processes. So dried meat can last greater than or equal to two years um, if it's um, dried down to that. So you hear of survival food or, or hiking food, that kind of thing. Okay. So um, that means you've got more time to use it. So you don't have these few days um, in which you need to really get it done. Um, and if you freeze different types of meat, you can see there, you know, it lasts a few months um, as a rule. Okay, 
So we mentioned the cook chill, um, eat leftovers within date. So remember I said it's only a few days really. Um, and this is quite good also because if you're tired after you've come home, your food's already there for you. You don't have to start cooking um, if you take this kind of approach, okay? Um, now dehydration. So this is one of my favorite um, ways of preserving food um, because it actually uh, reduces what we call the moisture content and the water activity. So moisture content, yeah, that's important for safety, but it's really what we call the water activity. And that is the water that's available for all your micro, your fungus and your bacteria um, to feast on the food there. So that's actually what we're really trying to control when we use a process like drying. So we're trying to starve those organisms so they can't grow um, on our product. So some things that you can dry, you can dry your tomatoes. So uh, sun-dried tomatoes in the oven, or you can actually sun-dry them in the middle of summer, maybe, uh, we're out in Queensland. Um, and so you have a really, you can have situations also, sorry, we can have quite a low moisture content, but still have a fairly decent um, water activity. Um, and so some things need to be very, very dry um, to actually be safe. So some nuts are an example um, as well, okay? So um, if we have enough of that free water, water activity and all the nutrients, because we like to eat all the, you know, some of us, um, like to eat all the broccoli carbohydrates and everything, but so do bugs um, as well. So we want to stop them being able to do that. So some things you can do, um, you can dry. Um, so you can dry with heat using an oven. That can destroy a lot of your vitamins though. Um, if you have a more um, industrial process, it's a little bit more costly, you can do what's called freeze drying. Um, so you freeze your product. Now, instead of coming off as, um, sorry, instead of being liquid um, at the start when it's come off, it's ice. Um, it turns straight from ice to vapor. Um, so it comes off that way. And because it's a cold process, you don't have as much heat damage to your vitamins. Okay. Um, and so that's why, and it also I mentioned it as a, um, it can be sometimes a very expensive process because of the energy involved to be able to do that. Um, and that's why sometimes freeze dried food might be a, a little bit more costly. Okay. So uh, that's some more traditional processes, I would say. Um, but you can do things like transforming your raw perishables into something with a longer shelf life. So your bottles of milk, they only last you know, a few days um, and some of the ones pasteurize really well, maybe a bit over a week, okay? Um, but you can make it last longer by turning it into yogurt. Um, so I've got some yogurt here. Um, and you can use this yogurt to turn your milk into yogurt as well. So we'll have a little bit of a slide in a moment. Um, so in your yogurt there, you've got the organisms obviously that um, help produce that yogurt. You can use that as what we call a starter um, and put it into some milk and get turn that milk into a yogurt as well. Um, if you wanted to do that. And then you can make cheese. I love cheese um, and all sorts of interesting things too. So transforming it into something else that's a little bit more stable. Okay. So um, there is an experiment I used to develop um, to, um, for my students to be able to do, um, which is making mozzarella using a microwave oven. So when you're making mozzarella, um, the temperature control is one of the really important pieces. And when you use a microwave, it actually speeds the process up a little bit. So you can technically, if you use this process and do everything nicely, you can have mozzarella in about 20 minutes um, minimum, um, which is quite nice. So what do you need? You need some milk, but you need some special milk. Um, so typically you need your gold top. So the one that's unhomogenized, it's got that nice creamy layer on the top. Um, and the reason why we need that one, to be able to get the cheese curd, which is our proteins, we need it to be available to come out of the milk. Now with homogenized milk, which is that fat's tiny little droplets of fat through your milk, the protein's actually tied up, keeping those droplets there um, in the emulsion. Um, and that means it's, very, it's a little bit harder to actually get them out um, to make your cheese. So in this case, you use your gold top milk, because um, it's not holding the fat in those little droplets, you can get your casein. So you end up with your curds and whey like Miss Muffet did. To get to that point, you need your citric acid, and that drops your pH, okay? So it goes low. Um, and we want it to get to about maybe four-ish, um, and that's when our proteins start coming out of solution. So they have a process we call precipitation. So they're kind of dissolved a bit in there, and we bring them out. We have another thing that we put in there called rennet. So traditionally, rennet was from calf stomach. Um, there's also vegetarian rennet out there as well. And what's in the rennet is some enzymes um, and chymosin, um, is the one that's normally in there. And what that does is once we've got our curds, it sticks them all together. So we've got a cohesive piece of cheese rather than just curd like we might with cottage cheese, okay? 
Um, and so we have those ingredients, then we have our microwave to control, bringing it up to the different temperatures for the different stages. And we do a bit of a stretching process because that's what causes that stretchiness of mozzarella as well. Um, and we can end up with our mozzarella ball. Okay. Now I've put a little bit of note there if anyone was interested um, and wanted to advise our organisers that they would like to know how to be able to do this, um, I can provide that um, as a download later on. Now I mentioned the yoghurt um, and you can use your sort of Greek type yoghurts, plain, um, to make yoghurt from milk. So you have your milk, you have your yoghurt, uh, you can have a slow cooker um, and why you would have the slow cooker, you set it on low um, and that's so you can keep it warm, so your nice little um, bacteria in your yogurt can actually grow and feed um, and produce your yogurt and produce more yogurt, okay? Um, so that's the whole point there. So there are instructions out there on slow cooker yogurt making um, as well. And then you can put that in the fridge um, when it's ready to go. And it doesn't take long. It can be an overnight process depending on what type of yogurt um, texture you want. If you leave it a bit longer, it might be a bit firmer. Um, if, you, if it's a bit shorter, it might be a bit, you know, more creamy, okay? So canning. Now, canning. Um, in America, they tend to do a lot of canning at home. Um, it's a little bit here in Australia as well. But to be able to do canning, you need to get to a higher temperature than boiling. So you can't use an open pot um, to be able to do this. So you have what's called a little um, canning water bath, um, and it's a pressure vessel, okay? So in industry, that's how canning is done. Your containers um, of the food. So I did have, uh, I haven't got it now. Um, I had a can of cannellini beans, okay? Um, and the way that it gets processed is it gets put into this vessel, got taken up to pressure such that it can get hot enough to be 120 degrees minimum-ish. Um, and then that forms not only a cooking process in some instances, but also a sterilization process too. So your canned food also can last quite a lot of time. Um, the issue with canning, obviously, is you're going up to very high temperatures. So again, there's issues with the degradation of vitamins, potentially flavour, and sometimes there's a bit of salt added to overcome those kinds of things. Okay, You do need to take care because some organisms that survive in canned food, um, there are some, uh, and we need to be careful if you're trying to do this at home. You also need to really take care with a pressure vessel. Okay, So you don't want things popping off at high pressure at you as well. Um, so make sure you have a, a very safe one um, that might have a pop-off valve as well. So if pressure gets too high, it can release a bit as well. Okay, um, you can do things with your fruit, uh, turn them into jam or marmalade, um, as I mentioned. Now, traditionally, we make jam with a lot of sugar. Now, the sugar isn't there just to make it sweet, but it's actually there to preserve it as well. And if you try and make a jam without sugar, but with something else then the food safety of the jam might actually be compromised. So it might not last as long. Now, you can make jam with other things. So um, there's a recipe I've been using the last couple of weeks where you can make jam with frozen fruit and with chia seeds. Um, so if you guys are familiar with chia seeds, they gel up nicely when they're wet or they're wetted. Um, so you can heat up your fruit, uh, add your chia seeds in a certain ratio, and you end up with a, an approximation of a jam. Um, but it doesn't have as much sugar as your traditional jam does as well. It won't last as long as a sugar jam though, okay? So you've got to be quite careful um, of those kinds of things. But with your chia, you've got a bit of protein in your jam uh, and you've got a bit of fiber in there as well. So you're adding a few nutrients that might not typically be in a jam as well, okay? Um, you can do your pickles and preserves. Um, there's a really good website um, that was the ABC one, um, which talks about quick pickles and then ones that take a bit longer which means their shelf life is a little bit longer as well. There's ones you can do with heat and without heat um, too. Um, and you can use some additives. Um, so salt is quite common. Acid, so you might have a vinegar-based pickle uh, or something like that. So a low pH, again, is quite important to stop your microbes growing. Um, so that's why you've got your pickles. So shelf life for things like quick pickles, um, where you might have your salt and your vinegar and some peppercorns, whatever, uh, four weeks. If you use some of the other processes um, that are at the link, then you have your longer one, longer shelf life ones, like your canned um, type products there. <clears throat> We're starting to get into some of the processes which need a little bit more finesse um, to avoid any issues. So you can um, ferment some of your food products. Now you can make uh, quite a few fermented products. So we mentioned yogurt before, which is a fermented product from dairy. 
Um, you can ferment vegetables as well. Um, so kimchi and um, things like that are some good examples. Um, you can do a non-alcoholic beverage. So I've got a picture up the top there. Um, and that's a product that's actually produced by one of my past students um, from a few years back. Um, and so she uses kefir grains. And for people who are familiar with it, they normally think a milk beverage. Um, but in this instance, she's using fruit and ginger and turmeric and things like that. Um, and the product that's actually produced is more like a, a fizzy drink type product, but it doesn't have all the sugar that you might typically have um, in a traditional fizzy drink product. Okay, so you can get what's called water kefir grains as opposed to just the normal milk kefir ones as well. You can also make alcoholic beverage. Um, so there's a, a bit I normally do where I've calculated if we turn all the potatoes and the waste in Australia into gin, several million litres, um, and we drown in gin, which is not, you know, interesting. Um, and with things like these beverages, it's a good source of gut bacteria. Um, so uh, promoting a healthy gut microbiome, and then eating foods that contain a bit of fibre sea jam that had your chia in it, um, and away you go, okay? Um, so I've just used that example there. Um, once you've finished the fermentation, though, you might still have some solids left that you're going to drain your drink off, and they can go into a compost. Um, so with um, my student there, Maya, um, who produces those drinks, she has a circular economy set up. So all the bottles, they get returned back to her, washed, sterilised, reused again. Uh, all the fruit um, and items that are used during the fermentation get sent off to an, uh, a digester um, to turn into compost or biogas and those kinds of things. Um, so really looking at reducing the impact on the environment and reducing waste at any type of level um, with this kind of approach. Um, and I will need to check in with her because she had a product a little while ago where she could send out the kefir grains and you can make this for yourself. Um, so that's an interesting thing there. We can do what's called extraction. So I've got a pot there of veggie stock. Um, so you can see there's, you know, carrot peelings, onion skins, etc., all those sorts of things. So you can chuck them in um, and make yourself up a veggie stock. So those are all your offcuts. And then once they're done, you can still chuck them in the compost, but at least you've extracted some goodness out of them before they headed there as well. Okay, um, so they do extract some nutrients and, and, you know, onion skin, we don't consider that really edible, um, not terribly pleasant. Um, and it's again, one of those byproducts. So something that gets produced through making food, um, but it's not something that we're actually going to eat. Okay, um, so I've mentioned already that after that, many of them can be composted. Um, and some veggie scraps can actually be used to grow other veggies. Um, so you've seen things sometimes where you cut the tops off something you plant it and you know, lo and behold, again. So with potatoes, they're a really good example. That if you've got an eye on the potato or something, um, you can replant um, and end up with more potatoes. Okay. Um, so we're getting kind of near the end um, of some of the things that I'm talking about. So we can say um, use everything. Um, so any bit um, that is food related, you can use. Um, so there is a product which has now been commercialised. Um, so I had a research student a couple of years ago who worked with this thing called aquafaba, um, which is basically bean water. Um, and so it, when you drain your can of chickpeas, that water, some people chuck it down the drain. Um, did you know you can actually turn that into marshmallow um, or meringue? Um, because there's proteins that have been extracted out of the chickpeas that actually help stabilise the foam. Um, and so that student started off some work last year. Uh, I had a French intern who extended upon that and she put agar um, in there, which helps uh, stabilise it as well. Now agar, um, for those who've done microbiology work, we think of agar plates and growing bugs, um, but it's a seaweed gel and there's edible versions as well. Um, and typically used in Asian confectionery um, quite commonly. We use gelatin quite a lot. Um, agar can be used similarly, but doesn't have the same texture. Okay, um, so you can end up with your bean whirl, which you normally chuck in the sink. Um, you can end up with marshmallow instead um, or meringue. Um, and then you can do what we call multiple products at once. Um, so this is my colleague, um, Andreas Helwig, um, who's an electrical, mechanical type engineer. Um, but he shares the interest uh, that I have as well um, in preventing food waste. Um, and so some things that you can actually do, we mentioned before that you can ferment your food scraps maybe into a beverage. So the setup that I've got there with the green square, um, I'm going to expand on a little bit. So it had on the left-hand side, a, a little fermentation of food scraps to produce an ethanol-based beverage. But on the right-hand side, which is surrounded by what looks like Christmas lights, um, is a spirulina tank. Um, so the CO2 is coming out of the fermentation um, of the food scraps where the ethanol is being produced and going into the spirulina to help feed it so we can get some multiple products at once. So a bit of an explanation of what's actually going on there. 
Um, so you've got your alcohol or fermented beverage um, your organisms are feeding on your food scraps. They are producing CO2 and ethanol. So those are familiar with the alcohol fermentation reaction. You know, those are the products um, that tend to come out. Now your scraps after that process, they could go to compost um, once you're done, but they could also go to feed the spirulina as well. So macroalgae, microalgae um, can actually consume some of the waste streams from food production as well. So over on the right-hand side, when we send the CO2 over, um, it helps that microalgae grow. Um, so spirulina kind of fed um, CO2 and your food scraps as well. Um, now what I'm going to, so I've taken you through a few different things you can do at home um, to use up your food and your food byproducts or scraps, um, which might be the common term. From an industrial point of view, though, we're looking at trying to tie a bunch of these strategies together to move towards zero waste. And you can do this on a small scale at home, this kind of thing. Um, so that diagram I showed at the beginning with the four colorful blocks um, of the different approaches you can have, we've expanded that out and I don't expect anyone to follow what's going on here, um, but just showing you a bit of the complexity of actually what's involved in trying to send food material via different pathways. So we've got some of the approaches we talked about here. So drying food into powders, um, feeding it into insect proteins. So some of your food, you know, black soldier fly and so on, insect protein, which is a good source of um, some omega-based fats, um, which could be for animal feed um, and various other things. But like I said, I don't expect you to be squinting at that <laughs> and figuring out what's going on. But the goal of this research and our model here is obviously towards zero waste but hopefully today we've shown you how you can apply some of that research at an individual scale or a distributed processing um, type scale as well. Okay, so that um, I've just left that there for handing out, but don't worry. Um, so that sort of reached the end of the talk portion, I guess. Um, and now I'm open for any questions and I'm hoping you guys have some really curly ones or some interesting things that you guys do as well um, at home and share ideas. So happy to take some questions. <laughs> oh, thank you, Polly. What I loved about your talk was that there were lots of things that are really easy for me to implement at home with my husband and child without <laughs> too much training. <laughs> um, so I will, if, if anyone um, does want to ask a question, please just um, put your hand up, type a message down the bottom and I will unmute you. But I do have a couple of questions, um, but people please feel free to jump in. One was um, what you were talking about turning the potato peels into gin um, with that fermenting. Potatoes, yes. Yes, <laughs> potatoes the fermentation process. So is there good gut bacteria in that as well? Hmm, interesting <laughs> question. So gut bacteria do tend to like fibre-based um, foods, okay? Yeah. Um, and when we're talking about, you know, um, there's, uh, we've got probiotics, which are our healthy gut bacteria, but then there are prebiotics, which people sometimes mix up. Um, and so potato fibre, yes, um, can potentially be a source of food for those organisms. Um, and if you've got them there, yes, um, they might feed on it there. Um, so prebiotics more okay. than pro. Yep. So in gin? Oh, well, uh, not much would survive in gin. Okay. All right, that answers <laughs> Yeah, that. high alcohol content kills that. <laughs> the other question I had with the mozzarella was where would you buy rennet from? Okay, um, so with the rennet that we use when we do that experiment, um, you can buy it online. So if you do a bit of a Google search, um, I found a supplier that was uh, in Brisbane, I think, um, I was able to go out there. So that one was, uh, and sorry, there is a little bit of a plug, um, a Cheese Links. So if you look them up um, in Google, you can find them. But there are all sorts of suppliers online. Some health food shops, um, if you go into them, you may find rennet as well. And they might have the vegetarian rennet too, um, if that's something of interest to you. Oh, and the other thing, sorry, I forgot to mention, is when you make your mozzarella, your mozzarella's there, but you also got a heap of whey um, as well. But your whey you can use in baking, so recipes that call for milk or liquid or something like that, um, you can use in muffins and cakes and all sorts of things too. Okay. We do have a question from David. Well, a couple of questions, thank you. So we have, can you clarify the placement of food in the fridge? What food at what level? And also defrosting. Any thoughts on those processes? Sorry. Okay. Well, pacing food. Questions. Okay. I'm not the best person when it comes to, <laughs> because my kids put the groceries away. Um, okay. But typically, if I think of my fridge anyway, we've got drawers down the bottom 
So I tend to put my veggies down there. Uh, then I put my meats on the lower shelf um, and that's in case, you know, there's any drippage or anything. We don't want it cross contaminating and, and don't quote me on any of this. This is just what seems to work. Um, and then I tend to have my dairy products and things up on the higher shelves. So keeping things away from each other, um, alluding to that question there is probably one of the important things. So you don't, uh, so you can avoid what we call cross contamination because some things are prone to certain organisms, some are not so much, um, but if you put them near each other, then you might run into a problem. So keeping things you know, nicely wrapped and separated um, is probably the important bit. But yeah, my fridge kind of guides me as to where, where things are meant to go. And defrosting. Oh, oh defrosting. defrosting. Um, so with defrosting, I do tend to do that in the fridge. Okay. So you obviously need to take it out possibly um, depending on how big it is. So for example, if you have a big chook roast or turkey roast for Christmas, that's probably going to need to come out you know, more than a day in advance. Um, and that's because there's so much thawing that needs to be done. It's a bigger volume. Um, if you've got like a piece of steak or something, you can take it out usually um, in the morning, put it in the fridge um, and it might be ready to use. Now, some microwaves, you'll know, have a defrost button. Um, and sometimes it's really tricky to get that right. Um, and so uh, I tend to be, it'll say, it'll last for a wait normally. And I tend to go under with that. So I avoid that starting to cook it while the defrosting has happened and then work my way up to it. Um, sorry, another question from Lydia. Thank you. Is this just lukewarm water for yogurt to be put into for making more yogurt? Sorry, lukewarm water into yogurt. Is it just lukewarm water for yogurt to be put into for making more yogurt? Oh, right. It's yes. So um, between 30, 40 degrees um, is usually what you're aiming for. Um, so if you look up some of the slow cooker recipes, some of them are maybe borderline um, up at your 40, but you want a nice warm environment. So body temperature around your 37 is sometimes good for them. Um, to keep them nice and warm. So, you know, trying to make yogurt on a cold bench in winter will be difficult. Um, you will need something to keep it warm. So there are things out that you could use as a slow cooker, but you can use other things like, um, a lot of you may have heard of the Easy Yo product. The way that works is warm water is poured in and then you sit the container and the level comes up the sides so that it's surrounded by that warm water as well. And it is typically an overnight process, okay? It's not a super long process either. And can you just continually make yogurt, like taking out? Technically, a you can. Um, after a while, though, you might end up with some mutations and things. <laughs> so um, it's a good idea every now and then to maybe buy some fresh starter <laughs> and, and get going again. Um, and that's true of beer as well. Um, so the, the yeast that you use for beer, um, it can get used. Uh, you can get some carryover starter from batch to batch, but then you reach a point of how many repeat batches. Um, there's too much mutation, so you need a fresh starter. Okay. So we're probably getting a bit to the, close to the end of our time. If anyone had any questions, um, please put them in, in the chat or let me know if you would like to answer, ask them yourself. But um, <laughs> while we wait for that, Polly, could you tell us how you got into food science? What you oh. were saying you were an engineer before. Yes. What made oh, okay. you change your path? I can tell you path? my journey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll probably start from the beginning. So, um, uh, you know, at around school age, I had an interest in science and probably one of my favourite sciences was chemistry. Um, but then I thought, well, a chemical engineer sounds interesting. Um, and I did that and it, there's a little bit of chemistry, but there's more engineering. Um, and to be honest, I didn't know what an engineer did uh, when I ended up in uni. But it was interesting, so I kept going. Um, now, what I did, um, some of you may pick up, I've got a bit of a Kiwi accent. Um, so I did my degree at the Uni of Auckland, um, which was in chemical and materials engineering. Um, and what that teaches you about is how you turn a raw material into a finished product. Okay? It doesn't matter what the raw material is. And that can be true of food as well. So when we're talking about our yogurt with our raw milk and starting with that as our, you know, um, raw material and turning it into something like yogurt, that actually is a process. Okay. Um, now materials engineering is a bit more about understanding the physical properties um, and maybe chemical properties of the food as well. Um, so for example, with your um, yogurt, you can test how viscous or how thick it is. Um, and that's a material science type of measurement. Um, and you can test maybe how squishy things are. Um, so marshmallows is one that I do quite often because um, it's got some really interesting behavior. 
um, and various other things. Now, how I got into food. Um, my very first job um, out of uni was working in the timber industry. Um, before that, I worked with steel wire um, as well. So I was working my way through different materials. Um, and then I needed a bit of a challenge uh, and I came back to uni to do my PhD. Um, now, when I did that, I was offered a project working on bioplastics um, at the time, but then they said, we really need someone on this other project, and they said, it's with Cadbury. I'm like, sweet. Um, so, so I said, all right, um, and, and away I went. Um, and so that, uh, my PhD thesis is in gummy snakes, um, and so understanding how to change the process from a traditional type process to a more continuous process, um, and what effect that has on things like structure and texture. Um, and all sorts of things. So I'm probably one of the few people in the world that stuck a gummy snake under an electron microscope um, to see what it actually looks like. Um, and so from there, I just kept working um, in food. And when I talk to new graduates um, who are chemical engineers as well um, as food scientists, I often say a lot of them are actually ending up in the food industry these days. And the reason being, we always need food, okay? There's a lot of other resources out there that we're starting to slow down um, on their usage, but we always need food. Um, so there's always an industry um, and a need to preserve food and, and make sure we can feed our populations. We do have another question. Thanks, mm -hmm. Olivia. Do you have any favourite ways to use parts of food that would normally be byproducts, such as beet greens, carrot tops, stems, etc.? I recently sautéed green, uh, cauliflower greens instead yes. of composting them. They're kind yeah. of like celery. Great question, Olivia. Yes, that is a great question. Um, so there are all sorts of things like that you can use. So um, one of them that we're looking at recently is sweet potato leaves um, and vines as well. So they're an interesting source of some nutrients. So I've got a student who's about to start a project on that. Um, so once we've got some more data, maybe I can talk a bit more about it then. Um, but one interesting thing, if you dig out the literature, um, when sweet potato leaves are actually dry, they're actually a fairly decent source of protein, um, which people might not even think of. Um, and plant protein is a bit of a thing these days when people are trying to you know, derive their protein needs from sources other than animal proteins um, for sustainability reasons more so than anything. Um, but yes, you can definitely use a lot of your leafy items. So your celery leaves, I'm not fond of the flavour, um, but you can actually use them in a stir fry or something like that as well. Um, and cauliflower leaves, yes, um, we've done that for a while. Um, also your broccoli leaves, although I just bought this one this morning, they seem to have taken most of them away. Um, but you can use those, all those sorts of things. Some of them, which are a bit milder, you can put in salad and things like that. Um, but yeah, sautéing or stir frying or those sorts of things, yes. I think we're at the end of our questions. Um, oh, with the banana ice cream, is it necessary to add any other ingredients or just no, um, the banana? You can actually find, and I'm trying to remember if I had a link on there, but you can have a recipe where it's just the banana solely. You can have ones where you add other things in too, but you can actually have just the banana itself um, and make ice cream that way. Delicious. <laughs> so um, I haven't got any more questions. So thank you so much, Polly. Um, they were just so practical. Um, and just to reassure everyone, if you weren't able to get all the notes down and, and recreate all of Polly's diagrams and <laughs> links to all her fabulous websites, we will send out her presentation tomorrow. Um, and we will also send you the link once this webinar is edited so you can um, share it with friends and family. So thank you very much, Polly. Much appreciated. Okay, no problems. Enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>